everybody. So today we are going to be talking about event modeling. So in this video, we're going to walk through the three main types of event modeling. And we're also going to go over what are the individual things that you need in your graph in order to do event modeling. And I'm going to give you a tip on how you can take one event and break it apart into its individual components. All right. So if that sounds interesting to you, Let's get started. This can come in a variety of forms. You can do your customer journey, which is very popular in customer 360s. You can do this for historical events, events in the news. You can do this for things like, you know, how does a vehicle get from one place to another? How does a flight get from one place to another? There are also things in event modeling that deal with insurance and uh, in loans. So, you know, what steps uh, do you have to take to be able to pay back a loan or not to get into an accident? And are you going to be likely to follow those steps that maybe we know historically lead to a better success of not getting into an accident or being able to pay back a loan? Uh, and how successful are you in getting your customer from the starting point of their event to your success criteria, like purchasing or downloading or whatever your success criteria is. So event modeling is really, really big in the graph space because think about any event. There's a lot of components, there's a lot of people. And so sometimes it can get a little overwhelming. All right, so let's start out with the basics. What do you actually need in your model to be able to do this? So the first thing you need is a taxonomy or a list of actors or people or entities, because it's not always an individual person. It can be a government, it could be an organization that is going to be important to your event. So. In this video, I'm going to be talking about event modeling in general, but if you are interested in specific types of event modeling, any of the ones I said in the intro, please leave it down below because I would be happy to do a specific video on that topic. All right, so when you have your actors in events, you're going to wanna to make sure with all of these that everything has a unique ID. If you haven't watched that video, it's up here. Unique IDs is kind of the name of the game with anything in graph and anything in databases in general. But if you're not using unique identifiers, please make sure you do so. It's gonna save you a lot of time in the end. So for each of these actors or entities, you're going to want to have their demographics or their attributes. So this could be their, their gender. It could be things like, you know, what kind of role do they have? If it's kind of in an organization, if they're a decision maker. If they're a pilot versus uh, a co-pilot, if they're the driver or the passenger, if they're the patient, if they're the doctor, you see the point here. You need to make sure that you have the attributes that matter to your event associated with that actor so that you can also find the patterns in how certain actors are playing a role or interacting with that event. Now you need to create your library events for each of the actors. What are the things that they could possibly do? Can they check something out? Can they review something? Can they get sick? Can they move? What is it that they can do in your model? Now, as a person, you can do multiple things, but if I sneeze uh, on the job and you're modeling whether I get to work on time, my sneezing might not be affecting that model. So, or maybe it is because that maybe means I'm sick. So you have to understand what pieces of information you're going to need for your event modeling, not necessarily all of the things that are available to you because you might not need all of them. So this is something that you're going to have to either look at historical information that you have for yourself in your company, what have you. If there's historical data like census data that you can use uh, that's external that you can get um, from others that have done this work before, or can you do a POC or some kind of early release of whatever you're trying to do to get some of that information? This can be click-through analytics. It could just be general behavior patterns. It could be how uh, this event has been shown in the past. Those are the types of information that you're gonna be looking at to decide what specific events are going to happen in the larger event that we're talking about. Now, there are three different types of events. There's a static event. This is the most common in a regular taxonomy. This could be an event of purchase. Maybe you don't need to know anything else. You just know that somebody can make the action of purchasing, but it could also look like 
this, where you have World War II and then the time frame that it occurred. So this is historical. We know what happened. We know when it started, when it ended. Uh, there's probably some discrepancy on date specifically, but year, we pretty much know that. Then you have dynamic events. So these are events that are still proactive. You're looking at historical data, but they do have multiple outcomes. There was only one outcome for World War I, right? So if you look at the uh, likelihood of somebody being able to pay back a loan, well, that is has multiple outcomes. You know, they might not be able to pay it back. There could be, you know, foreclosure. There could be bankruptcy. There's a lot of end outcomes in that. So that's not as predictive as if you were saying, you know, this is a foreclosure and that is always going to be the same sequence of events to get to foreclosure. So some other examples in this in this dynamic space would be recommendations. So you can look at historical data and understand what the events that you're seeing in front of you, right? This is that, that dynamic aspect uh, might indicate that this person is interested in. So you could suggest to them a new book, a new uh, article of clothing based on historical data, either from the person themselves, because you have personal information about them, or it could be about people like them. That's where those uh, attributes of individual actors is important. Or you just know from a generalization that people that are browsing at this time of night maybe need something to help them sleep. So maybe you suggest a weighted blanket for them, that sort of thing. But still, this is uh, predictive and it's not reactive because you are still kind of generating the logic before you're actually seeing behavior from the individual person. Then you have real time, and this is very much reactive. It is decisions being made. Now you still have some preordained logic, but it's constantly changing the model as it's seeing real time information coming in. So this could be a GPS. For instance, when you're driving, you might get a notification that there has been an accident. Okay, now you have to reroute. Or if you're doing something with weather forecasting, well, the weather can change very quickly. If you are doing some kind of event modeling for the open seas, uh, a storm can come upon you very quickly and you have to make very quick decisions on that. This also goes into supply chain. So supply chain, real time information doesn't necessarily mean it's rapid fire. It means that you are doing your suggestion and your analytics at the time you get the data. And that data has a very small window of being accurate and useful. So if you are doing supply chain management and you are getting real-time updates on where on the road your, uh, your trucks are, then you can look at the other two things we were looking at, which is GPS and weather and say, oh no, there's you know, a big hurricane coming through Louisiana. We should probably reroute or we can make adjustments farther down the supply chain to accommodate this issue. So these are more on the real-time application area and these are more reactive because you are reacting to things that are coming in at that time. Now, each of these events is going to have associations to it. These associations, depending on how you're modeling this, whether it's in a labeled property graph or an RDF are going to be different. Another video on that coming soon, so don't worry. This is really about how do you model this? All right, so the next two you really need to talk about with your stakeholders. This is how are you defining success and how are you defining failure? And both of these can be ranges. There could be multiple events or actions that prove it was a success or it was a failure. So if you're doing something with supply chain, your success might be that your driver got to their desired location within three hours, whatever it is that you're defining success as. Or it could be with failure, maybe they did get to their desired uh, location in three hours, but they accidentally didn't uh, tie everything down and you lost half of your goods. That's probably a failure. So that's why you have to define this as a range of things, a range of events, mini events in this larger event cycle that you're looking at. And specifically when you're dealing with the failure state, make sure you don't just look at the end of failure state, but blockers. And the same goes with success criteria. 
is what are the events that are going to increase the probability of success or failure? Those are two things that people tend to overlook. And I think those are actually some of the most critical because if you can understand, well, if I call this person one more time, maybe they are willing to convert uh, to to my product over somebody else's. Or, you know, if we uh, break down the chain of command in like a police force, maybe the response time is going to be faster. Those types of things are actually really important when you're talking about predictive analytics. And what is the duration of this event? So is it a static event? Like you check something out, that is a click. Or is it something more like, well, uh, somebody has to call another person to get approval for a loan. Well, how often does that happen? And how long does that call usually take? Those are things that you have to be careful about because if you don't record those, you could be making uh, predictions that might be uh, false positives, where let's say um, a phone call to uh, get approval, uh, you, you show that that actually proves out as successful because maybe there's additional oversight that helps with uh, making sure that the person will actually be able to uh, pay back their loan. Okay, well, what if that call ends up taking two hours? That actually is an opportunity cost because then that person making the call can't make additional calls to help more people get loans that might have been successful. All right, now we're getting into relationships. So uh, again, there's different ways to model the relationships depending on what kind of graph database that you are looking at. But for now, I'm going to go over the general way that you would model this, almost like doing it a whiteboard way. So you want to have your start time and your end time. And I sp say time specifically because when you're dealing with search, for instance, your completion of an event should be in milliseconds compared to potentially uh, getting approved for a loan, which might take months or even years, depending on what you're trying to get. So with start time, this can be a little tricky. You can use the explicit event. Someone came to your store, uh, an event started because uh, somebody got on the road or uh, somebody started the loan process, but when you're doing predictive analytics, sometimes it's really helpful to understand what brought them to you in the first place. Now, if you're looking at historical, you can see, let's say with World War I, the assassination of uh, Archduke Ferdinand by most accounts is, you know, what unsettled everything at that point in Europe, which kind of kicked off the events that led to World War I. That's why we're talking about the larger event and all the little events and actions that happen inside of that event to kind of lead to either the known uh, expectation of what happened, which the World War I, we knew what happened, or if you're talking about uh, what is happening in your customer journey, you kind of understand what the end goal is if you're looking at historical data, but what led them to purchasing? What led them to your site to begin with? A lot of times these things are really important to understand. Unfortunately, it takes a lot more work to do that. So if you do want really great uh, predictive analytics, I would encourage you to challenge yourself to look at the journey to that starting point in your event, because oftentimes there's a lot of really good nuggets in there for you to help uh, with your analytics and to understand why do people even care about you? Why did they even do an event with you? Because that often is a really important aspect. Now that you have the main two data sets, that event library, which is all the little uh, events or actions that your actors can take, and then your actual actors. Those are your two data sets here. Once you have that all together, you need to then start to map the event structure. So that means from that starting point, what are the different actions that lead to the different failure states and success states? And that is oftentimes the most work out of all of this. But what you can do, and this is what I was always taught, is uh, challenge yourself by taking any news article that is about an event, uh, a strike that may be happening in Hollywood. So this one will help you with a little bit of that predictive piece if you want. So what you do is you go through this entire article and you highlight the different elements that we just went through. So you're going to highlight which actors and if there's any attributes that you know about those actors, you wanna highlight that. And again, you can color code this, which I think is very helpful. And if you don't have any attributes, go look at Wikidata. Maybe those things exist in Wikidata. Uh, that's maybe where you can get some of that historical information if you don't have it. 
Then you're going to look at what actions can they take. And when you look at that, you look at those actions and you have to build out how did they get to that action? What if they didn't get to that action, right? So that's more of a uh, risk assessment. Well, what if they don't get to this aspect? And then you want to color code the start and the end state uh, that is in that article. So once you have all of those entities, you want to then start to whiteboard it. And that's where you're going to put the date or the time or the duration between each of these events and the sequence of those events. So each of the nodes is going to be a circle and the relationship is going to be uh, that time, that start time, that uh, duration time, that's what your relationships are going to be. And you're going to want to really focus on the sequence. So what, it's almost like an if then statement. So if this happened, then that happened. And once you have that mapped out, really step, take a step back and review and understand based on the article of the event that you're modeling here, did you really map out all of the different aspects that are the most important to this event, either succeeding or failing. And that is going to give you your very first event model. That's the other thing that people get overwhelmed with is there are so many different permutations. And that's why machine learning is often used in event modeling. But I think when you're first starting to learn, just think about the most important. Usually you want to tie this to revenue, customer success or satisfaction, something that is making you as a business or you as an organization uh, or a researcher successful in what you are doing. That's how you make sure that you are looking at the MVP of your event. All right, so I want to thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.